Welcome everyone to this seminar by Hansat Society on International Interparliamentary Assemblies, where we'll be discussing the role that these assemblies play, whether they're just talking shops or whether they perform significant roles. And for those who don't know me, I'm Christina Lester Bandera and I'm a professor of politics at the University of Leeds. But I'm very happy to say I have no problems at all to say that as a chair of this seminar, I actually know very little on the topic. So I'm very much here as a very good friend of the Hansa Society and to learn. So just a little bit of background on the seminar. Um, the Hansa Society has been following closely the development of the e UK EU uh, Parliamentary Partnership as Assembly, the PPA, as part of their general work on engaging on Brexit, post-Brexit scrutiny. And as they, they did this, they became very interested in looking at other international interparliamentary assemblies in terms of what sort of role they play. And they're focusing in particular in those assemblies that operate in the framework of an international treaty and which have UK delegations, which are appointed by the government because they are obviously other interparliamentary assemblies like the IPU, for instance, so that that doesn't fall into the sort of the focus we're having here. So we hear very little about these, we hear maybe every so often some news about there's been a meeting or uh, so so is a leader delegation and and they often refer to in the meet in the media as talking shops really but do they play important roles and that's what we want to explore in this seminar you know do they add value to negotiations to relationships amongst uh, different parliaments different countries foreign policy in so in one way do they add value but also so at the international level but also at westminster level are the arrangements currently satisfactory or should they be improved in any way so we have a fantastic and very experienced panel to talk about these issues um we have in so oliver hield um, the leader of the newest of, of these UK delegations, or the UK-EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, the PPA. We hope to also be joined by uh, Mr. Shelbrook, who is a leader of one of the oldest UK delegations to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And of course, we have also Lord Ricketts, who's uh, participating wearing several hats, really, due to all of his experience. Uh, so as himself a member of the UK delegation to the PPA or, and obviously a member of the House of Lords, but also obviously as a former senior diplomat with extensive experience both at serving at NATO, Paris and in Whitehall. So before I pass on the mic, uh, just an explanation about how the panel is going to, how the seminar is going to be organised. So uh, this is obviously a public event, it's being recorded. The recording will be available on Hansa Societies within the next couple of days. And Hansa Society will also be live tweeting at their Twitter, Twitter feed. In terms of how we're going to organize the seminar, um, our panelists will be invited to make some initial remarks for around eight minutes. And then we'll open up for questions from you all in the audience. So to ask those questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So you should be able to see that at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat because we will be not monitoring the chat. So ask your questions in the Q&A and you can start submitting your questions from the start. If you've got very pressing questions straight away or as you listen to our panelists. Um, but you can also upvote any questions. So if you see a question someone else has put in there that you'd like to ask, you can also vote on those and those will come uh, to the top and then we'll see them um, and we'll, we'll ask those questions. Obviously, um, we may not have time to uh, cover all the questions, but hopefully, you know, we'll have a, a good range of variety of areas um, in those questions. And the questions can be submitted anonymously, but obviously, if you can identify yourself, then that's much better to understand the context also. Um, so um, I think without further ado, I think I've given all my introductory um, instructions. I'll pass on to Sir Oliver Hield, who will we'll hear from his own experience as a leader of the, the, the UK, of the delegation to the UK EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. Over to you, Sir Oliver. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was in January 2021 that I was asked to take part in trying to organize um, at this parliamentary assembly between the UK Parliament and also the EU Parliament. 
And we'd been given some powers in the trade and cooperation agreement if we were set up, which were to scrutinize the work of the Partnership Council, that's the executive body between the European Commission and our government, to be able to ask for documents and that they would be given to us. And thirdly, that we could make recommendations uh, to them about things that should happen. But of course, it was a learning process just to set this, this up because it wasn't like some of the other um, parliamentary, interparliamentary bodies which are set up by treaty and have been going for many years, like the one that Alec chairs. Um, this was more of a joint uh, bilateral body that we were setting up between two parliaments. And we had to, uh, first of all, negotiate in our country between the House of Lords and the House of Commons as to how many uh, MPs there would be, how many Lords there would be, and how we thought it should work. And then having done that, and having passed a motion to set up a, a UK delegation and to, to take part in assembly, then to discuss all this with the European Parliament and uh, to, to reach agreement with them. And of course, they have a number of uh, joint committees with other countries, European Parliament and a number of other parliaments around Europe. And so we were looking at that model to see if there were things to learn from that and also from the inter-parliamentary bodies that we have uh, been members of in the UK. <clears throat> and so we were able to negotiate something which is bespoke. It's different from other joint committees uh, and it's different from the other inter-parliamentary bodies. Uh, I mean, I think it's quite important that there should be close cooperation in the way that it's run uh, so that it is supportive of a, a strong new relationship between the UK Parliament and the uh, European Parliament. And so we have to agree the agenda together and consult our bureaus, which is a wider number of members than just uh, the two co-chairs. And actually, it's gone well so far. I mean, we have had a lot of cooperation, and I, I think we've been able to uh, achieve some things. Our first meeting was in Brussels in May uh, 2022. And this was at the time when relations were just beginning to thaw a bit after the Ukraine experience and suddenly the recognition, well, we are all part of the free world. Um, and I think it was at that point that um, we, we had our exchange of views between Mark, uh, Maros Shevkovich, the commissioner, and the uh, government minister from the UK. And we were able to ask them both, well, is there a landing strip for an agreement on the Northern Ireland Protocol, for example? Um, and both said, yes, there was. And I remember asking them, well, is it in the same place or are you side by side miles apart? You know, um, and, and they both said that they thought there was scope for agreement. And so on both sides, the European Parliament side and our side, we were saying to them, well, for goodness sake, you know, let's get renegotiating and go the extra mile. And I think although we're not taking the credit for it because lots of things have come together to make that happen, you know, it is good that we're now seeing that uh, intense negotiation and attempt to, to reach an agreement. Uh, and uh, within our delegation, which uh, of course isn't all conservative, um, everyone was making the same point that, for example, it, it is daft that you can't get um, a, a sandwich made in Birmingham through to Belfast in time for it to be eaten fresh uh, because of the way in which the, the bureaucracy works. And so, uh, and that was a point made by Hillary Benn. So I think we've, you know, we've made some progress on that. Uh, we, we spotted that in the European Parliament, there was a great enthusiasm for energy cooperation and um, that there was a, a Danish uh, MEP, Morten Pedersen, who had said in one of the reports as rapporteur, look, Britain should be in the North Sea group of countries that cooperate on energy. And so this is one of the areas that we pushed and we made our first recommendation uh, recently to the Partnership Council that we should be in this northern group of of states cooperating and that we should have further cooperation on energy and it is now happening so we feel we're making we're making some progress we're also um, looking for solutions and this is something that my co-chair Nathalie Loiseau French politician who used to be Europe minister she makes the point regularly that we ought to be looking for practical solutions so that once uh, hopefully it does once the roadblock of Northern Ireland protocol is out of the way, you know, we've got some ideas on how to get us back into the Horizon programme, how to, to involve ourselves in a memorandum of understanding on financial services, how to help travelling artists 
who, who want to go around Europe easily, uh, and also on mobility for young people. So, you know, I, I think there are, um, there are some issues where we've made a difference. I mean, one of the unique things about what we do is that we have this state of play section at the beginning of the plenary, where the commissioner's there, the minister's there, and, and we're asking them both uh, the questions at the same time. And I think that is a very strong form of accountability for the two parliaments. Um, and then the other thing is we're, we're, we're working quite closely with select committees. So I mentioned Morton Pettersson and his committee in, in the European Parliament. But we're also working closely looking at the recommendations and uh, inquiries of our select committees because you know they can help us. Uh, we, we can help them to, to amplify what they're doing and vice versa. I mean, there are a, a range of other issues about representation. We've, we've asked observers from the, dele, uh, the devolved um, legislatures to come to our meetings and uh, have invited them as guests to speak from time to time. And I think that's important. And also the European Parliament wants to have its regions, uh, the region, regional committee and its, uh, some of its other bodies represented. And so we, we do that too. But the, the, the striking thing is how much we've enjoyed talking together about these important issues. And, you know, if you talk to the European delegation, I'm sure they'd say, well, it's really good to be talking to the to the Brits again. And uh, and, and we're enjoying it, too. So I think it's uh, it, it's helping with the with the relationship. Thank you very much. Some great remarks there on how the BPA was established and how the way of working. And, and clearly you feel that you are making a difference in terms of the issue. So it is adding value. Um, and, and you seem to be also connected with the select committees and other work happening in Westminster, which is interesting. Um, can we now go to Alex Shelbrook then to give the perspective from one of the oldest UK delegations to the, um, to the Parliamentary Assembly, in this case, to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. What are your perspectives on this in terms of the role that these assemblies um, role they perform? Thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, as you quite rightly point out, the um, NATO Parliamentary Assembly has been around an exceptionally long time. It was initially set up um, as the democratic oversight of, um, of NATO and, and the alliance. And it, it's been allowed to uh, develop and evolve its role that you now have a considerable number of um, delegates from each of the member nations um, based on population. Um, and uh, you've got America with 36, and then the UK, Germany, Poland with um, 18. And then, it, and, it, and then it sort of um, decreases down to a minimum of three. And within that, um, you're split into several committees, uh, Defence and Security Committee, which probably is what one would consider to be the nuts and bolts of um, NATO. Um, but then, the Economic Security Committee, which um, certainly expands its role wider than the North Atlantic um, Political Committee, again, um, works a lot with the partner nations. There's, um, there's dozens of um, partner nations. Um, the Climate Committee, Science and Technology Committee um, and, um, and Civil Society Committee for Democracy. And it's something new that's just been brought into um, the NATO Assembly on the um, really the push from the last president of the assembly, who was an American congressman, who said that for everything that, that NATO does, there's actually not a single broom cupboard in NATO headquarters that has anything to do with democracy. And that it was important that um, NATO was able to bring together its experience of developed democracies um, to help out um, and, and reassess what democracy means. Um, and a lot of that was driven by the events of actually what happened in America on the 6th of January and that um, democracy can't be taken for granted. So you're seeing through the political aspects and the political committee of um, the NATO Assembly that it's not just about our defence posture, it's about the stability of the alliance, the importance of democracy and how it moves forward. And I think that that in many ways highlights um, the importance of the soft power of, um, of a committee, because obviously we are bringing together a wide range of political philosophies across a wide range of countries um, and across, um, actually, if you take the partner countries, the entire globe. Um, and I think the, the principles that underlie um, 
the Western democracies have to a certain extent been taken for granted and have had to have been um, re-promoted, um, if you will. On top of that, then, we have the fieldwork. And I think the fieldwork um, very much um, really then strengthens um, the soft power in terms of the political side of it, if you will. Um, but in my committee, which I now chair, the Defence and Security Committee, we actually just completed this week a major visit, and we do five major visits a year. This one happened to be in the UK, and we were able to showcase um, Britain's Maritime um, Command and Naval prowess, um, finishing up at Ross Ith, um, seeing the Type 31s, um, and, and many of the delegates were from maritime nations. And, and what is very important um, that, that's come out this week alone, is that NATO will have to um, recognise that it's going to be more than just a transatlantic um, organisation. And that when we ask the direct question, is NATO able to contain and counterbalance the maritime threat, i.e. Russia, etc.? The answer to that is yes. Is NATO able to adapt to the threats that may be coming down the line? The answer is the trajectory is correct. What then completely upsets that ball is if the Chinese decide to break out with the increase, the significant increase in their naval powers. The Americans will be drawn into um, that conflict. They will expect um, NATO allies to take part. And then it will be important that the maritime capability ramped up because European NATO and maritime force is still reliant a lot on the Americans. And it's these conversations that are highlighting at an early stage the potential geopolitical conflicts that could actually change the entire um, security um, demeanour. Um, and these are the points we have to then start pushing back. So, I mean, at the moment, the UK is in a very strong position because it has the shipbuilding programme. The Type 31 export programme would be an obvious platform to ramp up for other countries to come forward. So you're actually looking at UK maritime industrial policy linking with the potential outcomes that are needed. Um, now, is it more than just a talking shop? Um, I certainly believe it is. Because, as I say, we're able to recognise threats that are coming quickly. We're able, as everything is open source, we're able to use those on the floor of the House in debates. I think there's more value in assemblies, actually, in the debates that take place, rather than just in the question times that take place. I mean, a, a, a department question time will be, if you're lucky, two bites of the cherry um, and a very straightforward answer, I think, to actually develop policy and develop concerns that has to take place in debates, as indeed we saw only a couple of weeks ago with the debate on the Russian grand strategy, which um, a lot of people from the NATO Assembly, as well as the Defence Select Committee, took part in. And I think that that really adds to what we're here to do, which is highlight the issues and debate them. But equally behind the scenes, um, there has been a lot of work going on with allies. I had some involvement back in May. The Spanish were doing some involvement um, last week in the sidelines, talking to our Turkish colleagues about Finnish and Swedish accession to NATO and trying to really understand through these backbench perspectives and not at the senior ministerial world leader um, uh, level, which obviously is very much in the spotlight whenever those meetings happen is to understand what is it, what are the demands, and where does perhaps the potential paths lay into how we can make this transition happen. And, and just understanding um, what are the politics behind uh, what's going on. So obviously in Turkey, there's a general election coming up. You know, that has a significant impact um, upon how the president wants to approach that election and how he sees how he wants to put across um, terrorist organisations which he perceives, um, working with Sweden especially, and, and how he wants to play that. Um, to be able to understand that directly behind the scenes is um, an important point to feed into the negotiations we have. And we often meet with um, ambassadors, especially any country we go to, um, and making sure this is fed in. And then we have other aspects where, for example, when Nuzgani was on board, she was able to really highlight um, through um, her committee, the Chinese human rights, um, um, the um, 
um, what's going on with the um, Uyghurs. Um, and of course, that they're making sure that a lot more allies are starting to get on the same page of issues that may be really prevalent in the UK and the concerns we have, but making sure allies can come along with them. But I don't think it could ever be overstated uh, the importance of having that access to not just allied countries or partner countries, but the fact we're all backbenchers and the fact that we're not tied by a line to take or by a civil service output or indeed the glare of the world media. And therefore, we can have far more honest conversations and really understand the political situation in each other's countries, not least around the fact that we are balanced across all political parties. And I think it's noticeable in all of these um, assemblies that there is a common working purpose and the politics stays in Westminster. Um, and that, I think, gives, certainly in the UK, a very significant strength to foreign and defence policy that because you're working together at these levels, there tends to be a consistency. And I think that, again, what comes out in the Russian grand strategy debate is that Majesty's opposition and government are in lockstep with each other on the major um, international issues and how it moves forward. Um, I think, um, just to close my remarks for now, that um, one area which I think came out in the speaker's report, which I think it needs to be examined further, is um, how the procedures and arrangements um, work. In terms of actually arranging visits, there is nothing to complain about. Um, the overseas office does an excellent job um, and um, prepares all the travel, all, all the hotels, and you can have the odd hiccup in trying to sort out the expenses afterwards, but nothing really. Um, as I say, the UK visit, which took place last week, um, the, the civil service made that happen. Um, it was an absolutely fantastic visit. We showcased off the UK excellently, and um, and that is down to um, the people who do that. I think where um, you've got the ability to improve is in the dissemination, um, and, um, and and what the NATO assembly isn't doing, although we did actually arrange in the UK a meeting with, is a liaison with the Defence Select Committee. Um, but of course, it would be wider than that. There, there would be for those on the political committee the need to maybe liaise with the Foreign Affairs Select Committee um, and bring those things together. So I think there's a gap between worker select committees and things like the NATO Assembly, and that could be improved. And then equally, I think um, the civil service picking, picking up a dissemination of the work we do and getting that out to a wider audience would actually, I think, show the value of the work that's going on. So I'll leave my comments there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And you touched at the end in there um, on, on the link with select committees, which is something I hope we can explore a little bit more later. Um, and just remind the audience that you can ask questions. Please do start posting questions. We already have three questions. The first one actually links to this to how can we make those dialogues uh, happening in a, in a smoother way with Westminster. But before we move to the question and answer, just uh, Lord Ricketts, what are your reflections on the topic? Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think I can be fairly <coughs> brief, excuse me, um, after the uh, comments of my two colleagues. Let me say a few things with my hat on as a former UK ambassador, and therefore uh, with a sense of how these interparliamentary assemblies are looked at in government. And then a few comments to add to Sir Oliver's and my experience as a member of the uh, UK delegation to the EU UK Parliamentary Assembly. So if you are sitting abroad, um, my own experience of interparliamentary assemblies was when I was ambassador in NATO. This is uh, well before Alex's time, 20 years ago. <clears throat> but the um, largest impact of uh, the British Parliament on the life of um, British embassies abroad really is the select committees, um, who a select committee visit will be a major uh, event for an embassy involving a lot of work on a program. Um, and by definition, they tend to be dealing with governments, whereas uh, interparliamentary assemblies tend to be dealing with other parliaments. And so the involvement of governments and embassies is probably less. Uh, in addition to select committees, of course, through, in the landscape uh, of parliamentary engagement, there are all party parliamentary groups who also uh, mount a um, energetic series of visits to uh, other bilateral countries, uh, which can also um, take up quite a bit of time. So in terms of the interparliamentary assemblies at NATO, uh, Alec no 
knows this very well, but my own involvement as an ambassador was mainly by giving the UK delegation a dinner at the outset of a meeting and then a debriefing at the end to hear what had gone on. To be absolutely honest, I can't think of any specific occasion when uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly directly influenced UK national security policy. I think the influence of these interparliamentary assemblies are more indirect, but real and important for that reason. What do I mean by that? Um, interparliamentary assemblies mean better informed MPs and peers. Um, they mean that when MPs um, come to their select committees, um, their statements in the House, um, their contributions in all sorts of ways to um, promoting policies and scrutinizing governments, they are better able to do so because they've been directly engaged with the issues uh, and also with other parliamentarians. That's true for NATO. The other main parliamentary assemblies, just to complete the picture, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, is very active with a series of working groups. Uh, and the um, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly uh, is also important, uh, for example, in organizing election monitoring uh, missions to oversee elections in member states of the OSCE, which can be pretty influential uh, at some points. So these, these parliamentary assemblies are doing real work, as we've heard from, from Alec. Um, they uh, can uh, have an indirect influence, I think, on the course of government policy. They provide an opportunity, crucially, for parliamentarians to get together. Uh, that's good from the point of view of personal contacts uh, and uh, friendships. That shouldn't be neglected. Um, it also is an occasion where the parliamentary view of a particular issue emerges pretty strongly. Uh, that's important for um, British embassies abroad engaging with them. It's important for the government at home. It becomes a forum where the issue of the day can be crystallized, and that all adds to the um, impact and the, and the effect on government. And I think Ukraine is a, is a good example now with um, what the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has been doing. Uh, to go back to my own experience in 2003, I was in NATO just at the end of the Iraq war, or the, the invasion of Iraq, uh, at a time of deep division within the alliance, actually. And the NATO Parliamentary Assembly reflected that uh, division as well. But the debates then were helpful in looking ahead rather than just breaking over what had happened in the past. And I think that practical focus helped NATO move on fairly quickly to deciding to set up a training mission uh, in Iraq in 2004. So I think the parliamentarians had a real impact on the atmosphere uh, and the relationships between allied governments at a particularly bad time. Just a couple of thoughts now uh, in my hat as a current member of the UK EU Parliamentary Assembly. I think I see it playing essentially the same role. And first of all, I wouldn't disparage at all the fact that it's a talking shop. It's certainly much better to talk among parliamentarians uh, you know, than for there to be no shop or an empty shop and no talking. Um, and I think it's vital in sustaining contacts between uh, British parliamentarians and uh, uh, MEPs. I think there was a risk otherwise of that drifting apart. There was going to be less formal uh, opportunities for parliamentarians to meet in an EU context. And I think the fact that we're having these six monthly meetings is at least a start. It's also creating a space where new members of parliament on all sides can join and, and meet, because I worry that otherwise a generation of parliamentarians who don't have our um, experience will um, be much less engaged with other European parliamentarians. So I think the talking shop aspect and the personal contacts is, is not uh, to be neglected. Um, and of course, we do have uh, under the trade and cooperation a, a treaty role in scrutinizing the Partnership Council. Uh, and as Sir Oliver said, we, we've heard from um, commissioners and, and British ministers. I think that's the start of a process. We're just at the beginning, I think, of exploring the um, scope that the uh, Parliamentary Partnership Assembly has. We've produced one um, joint recommendation on energy. And I would very much hope as we move towards the review of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement in 2025, that the PPA can be uh, a forum for coming up with ideas on areas that have not been working, uh, opportunities to fill gaps, 
uh, or improve cooperation um, and uh, UK partnership in some of the major projects like Horizon and Erasmus could be um, an important part of that, as well as, I think Sir Oliver mentioned, mobility, uh, youth mobility, something that touches the lives of all citizens around the EU. I also finally hope that it will be possible to find ways of keeping up the momentum. Six monthly sessions don't really create um, a great deal of momentum, uh, and it has to be recreated each time. Uh, and I hope over time we will find ways of doing inter uh, inter meeting um, work, intersessional working groups of some sort that can keep groups of parliamentarians working so that there's more substance to feed into the six monthly meetings. But we're off to a good start, uh, and it's certainly an important part of the overall UK-EU landscape. So let me leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for those initial remarks. We have quite a few questions, and I think some of them um, just trying to push you further into some of the remarks we already made. So I was going to start with a question by Baroness de Souza, who's coming back to the, the linkage with um, Westminster effectively. And she says that, that these channels are definitely valuable, but could they be made even more valuable if there were mandatory means of reporting back on the impact of specific topics covered in our dialogue. So in, in many ways, this comes back to the point that Alex Shelbrook made earlier about uh, linkage liaison with specific select committees. But what do you think about this? So I could come to, to you, Sir Oliver, first. Um, should we have more um, means and actually mandatory means to report back on the specific uh, topics to show the, the impact? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think she's absolutely right. And I mean, if you look at um, what we've started to do, um, we, we do have a report newsletter of, for each plenary. And the other thing that we do is we have breakout groups at these sessions where we talk about the pipeline of issues we want to look at and the sort of solutions we're, we're keen to, to work on. And uh, those are reported to the select committees. And so I think there is a case though for when we get the answer to our recommendation on energy, which we're expecting soon, then I think there is a case for asking for a debate about that so that we can widen out the parliamentary involvement in that. And of course, Lord Kinnall, who's one of the Bureau of the PPA, he is in the House of Lords uh, as is Peter Ricketts. And uh, I'm sure that he would be very willing to help with, with that because he's the chair of the uh, European Affairs Committee in the House of Lords. So yes, there's much, there's much more to be done, but I, I think that, uh, we, as Peter said, we've made a good start. We do have delegation meetings, so that's the UK delegation, um, in between, so that we're able to uh, have uh, officials from the various departments, other speakers come and talk to us, and we'll be doing another one of those soon. So uh, I think it's a process rather than the final, uh, the final position, but she, she makes a good point. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll, there's this question specifically about the involvement of Northern Ireland Assembly, and I'll come back to you on that. But before we move on, Alex, do you have any more views on that, on those mechanisms to report back um, to Parliament? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a... Um, you, you see, everything we do in the Parliamentary Assembly becomes a public document. Um, in terms of the actual research we do, etc. And then they actually feed into the NATO organisation. So when we get to the annual assemblies, we will be taken on board the comments from the Secretary General and they will be um, voted on the plenary and they obviously help feed into the overall agenda debate. So when you're talking about the influence that the assembly can have on overall policy in terms of, if you will, the solid tangible reports we do. They eventually feed all the way into the leaders summit and very much directed by um, um, NATO headquarters. Um, so we, we're doing a real sort of base of the pyramid level of work there that feeds in. I think it's noticeable when you look at the assembly, um, how many ex defense ministers are, are on it and whether they were on it before they were defense ministers or after they were defense ministers foreign office ministers. Um, I think when you look at the overall balance of committees, it's interesting how many privy councillors are on there. So I think you, you, to a certain extent, see there's a level at, at which um, 
involvement takes place. And the reason I mention that is because you then tend to have a lot of back channels to fill in. And where we have the um, conversations beforehand in organised meetings with somebody from the Foreign Office before we go to the Assembly, we equally have a senior um, desk officer from the Foreign Office comes to um, the annual meetings. Um, and I think there is actually far more link up and feeding back into the relevant departments than perhaps would appear um, obvious. But I think there is, as I said earlier on, I think dissemination is something that could be looked at more closely, which is indeed a recommendation in the um, speaker's report that he um, had commissioned. Um, and I think that um, overall, the question remains as to do is there to be a more significant body that has to do work in Westminster as well as just went away on the assembly, even if that was just on a biannual basis and having an almost committee that reports on the floor of the House specifically or not? And I think that's something um, to be examined. And just to um, build on Lord Wickett's comments, um, NATO itself has a biannual meeting every six months. It has the spring assembly where draft reports are ratified and the annual assembly where um, reports are done. And, and there is a momentum to that. But actually, where the momentum really grows in the assembly, and this is what needs to be looked at with the EU assembly, is, um, is all the meetings that take place. And we are away on a fieldwork visit once a month split into the different committees, looking at the different areas, but roughly once a month. And then you add into that standing committee where all of the senior leadership roles um, come together. Again, you're keeping that momentum going. And one of the things I didn't um, answer in my opening comments was what, what role the leader of the delegation has. Um, and myself and my um, predecessor, um, um, Lord Benyon, um, made sure that we lobbied very hard for UK to get into good positions. And actually, just out of our 18 members, the UK really punches above its weight and has chairman of committees, chairman of subcommittees, rapporteurs, general rapporteurs, people on the bureau. So, you know, we are able to actually, as a leadership role within Westminster, make sure we do everything we can to get UK interests represented. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move now to a question about the involvement of Northern Ireland Assembly, because there's quite a few people who would like that question to be put. And, and I'll come to you first, Lord Ricketts, and then I'll come to you, Sir Oliver. So the question is say, asking, given Northern Ireland's particular status in applying a lot of the EU law, um, don't you think it's unsatisfactory that representatives uh, of the Northern Ireland Assembly, or indeed the other devolved legislatures, can only have an observer status for the PPA plenary sessions? They can, as Oliver has mentioned a few times, speak at breakout groups, but not at the main plenary, which is when the protocol is one of the main topics of discussion, whether they should be doing so. So Lord Ricketts first. Well, I think I'm going to actually pass the floor to Sir Oliver on that, because I'm sure this is an issue that has been involved in the Bureau and, and a lot of careful thought uh, at the kind of leadership level of the PPA, as it were. As you say, I mean, we have certainly um, uh, representatives from uh, Stormont uh, who are there as observers and they take an active part in the breakout sessions. But honestly, I think Sir Oliver will give you a more authoritative answer to that question than I can. Thank you. Sir so Oliver. Well, we set up the um, Assembly as a UK Parliament, EU Parliament body. But of course, we expect our delegation to be able to represent all parts of the United Kingdom. And so we do have on our delegation, uh, for example, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, who's leader of the um, uh, DUP, and we, we also have um, Margaret Ritchie, who used to be leader of the SDLP. So we do have members from Northern Ireland on the UK delegation, and then we involve the assembly as observers, but that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily speak. I mean, as you say, they do speak at the breakout groups, which I, I believe they found helpful. And um, we actually had a session, w which was for the um, legislative um, bodies from the devolved uh, bodies and also uh, the Council of the Regions and the um, uh, uh, civil society body, which the um, EU delegation wanted to hear from as well. Um, and so we had we had an opportunity then for them to speak to, uh, at plenary and um, answer questions and so on. So, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly trying to um, ensure that there is a, a good, you know, good place for the UK generally and EU generally to 
to come together and as parliaments and, and discuss these matters. But it is actually a, a body between the UK Parliament and the EU Parliament, and we, we have to respect that to, to some extent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to you now, Lord Rickardson. It's about um, a question linking to when you mentioned about the need for parliamentarians to be better informed. And this person who's asking this question is asking, saying that one of the striking things about from the PPA meetings is how much MEPs themselves know about what is happening, maybe more so than their UK counterparts. And the question is put in terms of, is there a prospect that the culture in Whitehall will change to allow MPs and peers to be informed more regularly on the issues rather than the government treating all such information as state secrets. But also I'd like to broaden that up that question a bit more, you know, what are the factors that may make uh, MPs or peers seem less informed than MEPs? Obviously, it's obvious say that is a question asking this, um, but quite a few people would like to, to look into that in terms of how are parliamentarians informed and is some of that due to a culture in Whitehall of keeping everything secretive? Okay, I mean, I don't think I agree, really. I think we have some extremely well-informed uh, members of the UK uh, delegation to the, to the PPA. Uh, many of them in the Lords and the Commons have served on uh, relevant committees. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, another member of the Bureau, Hilary Benn, uh, who of course was chair of his own uh, Commons committee and, and a real specialist in, in many of these areas. Um, just like with NATO, we have meetings uh, with officials uh, as well uh, in the PPA. So I mean, it may be true that some MEPs have more specialised knowledge in some areas of the EU than uh, British members of Parliament in particular, who have, of course, their whole constituency to take account of. They are national uh, parliamentarians in a way that uh, members of the European Parliament are not. So in, in some ways, it's more possible for an MEP, who is by definition specialised in uh, EU issues, to be, uh, you know, to be very well informed on particular areas than uh, members of Parliament who have to cover the entire spectrum of uh, their constituencies' interests and government policy, um, but we do indeed have some people from the Lords who you know, don't have that, um, that uh, need to be as broad as, as MPs are. But nonetheless, I think we've had some extremely um, uh, well-informed and articulate um, contributions to the debates in the PPA from both sides. Um, more generally, I mean, my experience is that um, in government, um, it's in the interests of the Foreign Office, for example, to stay close to MPs who take an interest in um, particular areas. We talked about NATO, we talked about EU, and the Council of Europe also, I'm sure, keeps close to the government and the OSCE, uh, particularly when they're going out and doing their field work. So I think it's wrong to think that there's a culture of secrecy in Whitehall. I mean, I think there was there were problems around the provision of information uh, on the uh, progress of the negotiations on the TCA, but I think it is true that the uh, European side was probably briefing their MEPs more than the British government were on this side. The British government wanted to keep the negotiations confidential while they were going on. But I don't get the same impression now. I'm interested to hear what my two colleagues say. Uh, so I don't think it's a structural problem. I think it just reflects the fact that it is a national parliament engaging with a specialist body of members of the European parliament. And therefore, it's not entirely level playing field in terms of the time that uh, members can spend on particular EU subjects. Thank you. Um, Alex, would you come on, on to this? Yeah, I mean, just, uh, I, I think just to expand on that, I mean, I think the age-old question about what do MPs do, you know, people turn on television and they see the chamber empty and they say, oh, they don't do anything, etc. And I think, you know, there's no way to sort of disprove that in terms of public theatre. But, of course, what, what we are doing is, is an enormous amount of research. And I think that um, I think we actually are very well informed, um, whether you talk about it being state secrets or not. I think it's about informing a conversation. But I think also one of the real value added things is you can know about something, but not necessarily fully appreciate the impact of something. And what's wise in my mind there is that we all were well aware of um, President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we're all well aware of um, the impact that potentially has on European businesses. But not until we were at the Transatlantic Forum in Washington did the absolute fury that 
poured out of French and German delegates towards um, people in the United States Congressmen, etc., come to the fore. So I think you actually have then that better understanding of um, where the European political philosophy at the time is, if you will, relating to a particular subject that gives you the real value added. So I think we are actually very well informed. But I think that what the actual one of the real extras to that is, is then seeing firsthand the impact that that's having on a political domestic level, um, which obviously then highlights perhaps where the really big issues of the day are um, into how um, we, we also take conversations forward. Thank you. If I could move in a slightly different direction now, if that's OK. I've got a question by Arabella Lang, who works a lot on international treaties. And, and she's asking, how should future treaties be drafted to give parliaments a more effective role in providing accountability and democratic input? And of course, in the context of a seminar about international parliamentary assemblies, I'd like to hear your reflections about this. You know, can these assemblies or the, the delegations into these assemblies play a role in supporting that accountability and democratic input? And so Oliver, can I come to you first? So then I'll go to Lord Vickers and then um, Alex Shelbrook. Yes, I mean, I think particularly a country like the, the UK, where we have a long parliamentary history of holding the government to account, um, I think we, we would want to see um, the sort of powers that we would, formal scrutiny powers, which we were given in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And that does, um, that strengthens our position, although our body is a parliamentary creature in the sense that it was set up by our parliament and the European parliament, to have in the treaty that uh, those powers ma makes a big difference. And uh, I think if you look at a lot of parliamentary assemblies, uh, or certainly these joint committees that they have in, in Europe, uh, they don't have quite the powers that, that, that we do. And I think that um, you know this is a great strength and something that we should look to for the future. So uh, uh, definitely a good thing. I mean, the other point I'd make is that in our uh, delegation, 35 from each uh, parliament. Uh, we do have uh, heavy hitters, if I can put it in that way. I mean, people like Andrea Ledson, who's been the business secretary. We've got the um, the chairman of the Select Committee on Business, the seat, one of the senior members on the Northern Ireland Select Committee, and so on. So it's a it's a, it's a high powered uh, delegation, and so is theirs. Uh, I mean, it's full of senior uh, European Parliament members who who have had experience. I mean, my co-chair is a former Europe minister for France. Um, and so I think the, the the powers with a strong delegation from both sides make, makes uh, makes it very influential. Thank you. Lord Ricketts. Uh, yes, I mean, in terms of treaty making, treaty making has to be a function of governments and negotiation between governments. Um, Parliament, uh, of course, has its um, responsibility for eventual approval of treaties, and, and that uh, often can be at the point beyond which any um, further you know, changes can be made to them, although it did feel in the course of the various negotiations over uh, leaving the EU that there was a great deal of um, uh, endless parliamentary scrutiny over the various steps involved. Um, of course, there are many treaties which don't need a, a great deal of um, parliamentary scrutiny, but there are some that are and, and certainly get it. Um, so I think the occasions where um, a treaty is going to establish a parliamentary assembly and formal parliamentary oversight will be quite rare. Um, you know, that has not happened all that often. Um, there are really only the, uh, the four that we mentioned in this call at the moment. Um, I think the general question of um, parliamentary oversight of treaties and the way treaties are implemented and holding government to account for that, yeah, that comes into a broader issue, scrutiny, including um, scrutiny issues that will arise as we go through um, the next year or so on uh, retained EU law and so on, there's a big issue there. But in terms of how this PPA is going to work, I agree with Sir Oliver. We have the basis clearly set out in the TTA, which is a treaty. Uh, we are just beginning to learn, I think, how we can use those powers effectively. But over time, I hope we will develop perhaps not as extensive a network of uh, working groups and so on as the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has, or Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, but we will um, gradually entrench um, broader and more regular uh, use of the PPA powers uh, so that we can be you know, both scrutinising and actively inputting to government policy. Thank you. Alex, 
I mean, I think that from the NATO PA point of view, it, it very much comes down to how we work with the impacts of treaties. Um, and certainly something I've been talking about really ever since it was enacted in December 2017 is Article 42 of the Lisbon Treaty, PESCO, Permanent Security Cooperation. Now, within it, there's nothing particularly wrong. In fact, the Americans think it's a great idea that you're going to have this European Defence Fund, that you're not going to repeat procurement, so you're going to procure efficiently, effectively. My concern has always been that you will end up with individual countries having ownership of the specific majority areas of kit. And I, I then wonder how you um, can trigger Article 5 in any speed, especially if constitutionally you are restricted from taking part. And now we have seen the prime example of that with the leopard tanks in Germany. Um, and I think, therefore, that you could be in a situation within a procurement generation that you almost completely undermine what NATO can do. And it may well just become a maritime force and the Americans may walk. Now, identifying that as a risk, because the treaty exists, it's not going to go anywhere. And the European nations are signed up to PESCO, etc. And, and indeed, we will become part of PESCO if we want to um, put our um, defence industry into the European market, because it's effectively a closed shop. So we're going to have to do that. But it's not to argue about whether PESCO should exist or not to exist. It's about recognising that right now, 20 to 30 years out before this could be a problem, that we should be understanding and developing protocols between NATO and the European Union as to how an Article 5 event would actually smoothly happen and work forward if you are running into some of the constitutional problems that we have just seen in relation to leopard tanks going to Ukraine. And so I think it's not about how do you influence treaties. As Lord Ricketts said, it's a function of government and, 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 and parliaments to approve. But when these treaties are in place, especially ones which have nothing to do with our parliament, it's using these assemblies to actually highlight the issues. Because sometimes when you're in it, you don't recognise perhaps the pitfalls and those of us on the outside. And in, interesting enough, Turkey, Norway, the Americans now are starting to recognise that it's not quite as simple as it looks. So I think there's a body of work to be done on treaties to make them work efficiently as time goes on, um, rather than try and take any ideological view or try and um, change them, etc., um, to make sure that these things, especially in a NATO relationship, can work smoothly together. Thank you. And now reflecting in terms of the intra UK interparliamentary relations, so relations between different literatures and the different uh, executives within the UK. Do you think there is any lessons we can learn from these international interparliamentary experiences that could be applied in those relationships? Um, who would like to go first? Shall I come to you, so Oliver? Any thoughts on yes, that? Um, I mean, one of the things that we had to do during Brexit was to talk together between the uh, Westminster Parliament and the uh, other devolved legislative um, uh, bodies, and we, we set up the Interparliamentary Forum, which um, the, the House of Lords has recently taken the initiative in saying, well, look, let's do more with this. And one of the things we're trying to do for the, um, uh, for the PPA is to have the Interparliamentary Forum meet before we do and, and come up with any issues that um, are particularly of interest across the uh, various uh, legislative bodies of the UK. So I think that's welcome. And then the other thing is that, of course, before each uh, each PPA, we do anyway ha have meetings and discussions with the, um, the, the, the various uh, legislative bodies. I mean, I think one of the problems we have had with the Northern Ireland Assembly has been that it hasn't been uh, up and running in quite the way that we would all hope. Um, and so, I mean, although we've been able to have representatives uh, come to uh, as observers to the PPA, I think uh, if, if that can be resolved, uh, that would help a, a great deal. Thank you. Book <clears throat> Ricketts? No, I have nothing really to add. I think this clearly um, has, a, has a real importance in, in the case of the PPA. Uh, I'm not sure to which uh, extent which is uh, an issue for the other interparliamentary assemblies. Um, but it is all part of an issue about how devolved uh, assemblies are 
represented uh, abroad, indeed uh, devolved administrations. Um, there's an increasing network, in my experience, as an ambassador of um, devolved administrations, having representative offices uh, set up in the major capitals and having their own quite extensive uh, international network uh, on trade, investment, cultural promotion, tourism, and so on. And so I mean, it seems inevitable that we must find the right mechanisms for involving them, particularly in the PPA, given the uh, extensive interest that all the devolved administrations and assemblies will have in that. Thank you. Um, Alec, did you want to add something to this? I've got one final question, but if you wanted to add something to this. No, it's, it's quite a different relationship in NATO. I'll just add that, you know, in terms of um, the devolved assemblies, Westminster representatives of those assemblies are on and the parliamentary assembly so i mean there is a link back but it is a very different situation to um oliver's um assembly but i'll let you back on to the next question thank you um, i'm just aware of time i know we started slightly late but um i think we still have one final question to come in if that's okay so this is a question from sarah Yo yoannu who has worked a lot in supporting a, a variety of delegations in this area and and she had a reflection on how one of the key differences one of the key issues of these delegations is actually the lack of support for the leader in terms of strategy and thinking about strategy and how to approach it so there's a lot of support in terms of as you said yourselves about the mechanisms the, the bookings and all of that but not necessarily about thinking ahead and um and adding to that reflection she asks whether uh, fco could adopt a, a parliamentary diplomacy as a thing which can advance uk goals and as such push for better mechanisms for parliamentary visibility of the work of these delegations and that this in, in turn would add impetus to the support provided to the delegations because changing parliamentary procedure is extremely slow without coming from the government side so um, what are your reflections on this? And we'll say this is a, these are your, the final reflections really on, um, on the topic. So Oliver, I'll come to you first. Well, I mean, I'm lucky uh, to have uh, the Clark's team and, and the support that I, that I do have. And um, although it's in no sense party political, um, I'm very lucky that um, Gillian Burke, who's the House of Commons representative to the EU. He, he meets uh, European politicians uh, and uh, officials the whole time and keeps me very fully informed. Uh, in, in addition to that, we've set up a European unit um, in, in Parliament to provide research for us. And I don't know if Peter Ricketts would agree, but I think it was absolutely excellent for the plenary we held in, uh, in Westminster in November. And then in addition to that, of course, I'm lucky in the Bureau to have um, Lord Canool, who's chairman of the uh, Select Committee in the Lords, and Hilary Benn, who's immensely experienced. But also, I mean, we are collegiate and we're, we're, we're looking not to be the government, uh, although we you know, welcome uh, the help that we've had from the ambassador to the EU and from uh, foreign office officials, which is good. You know, we've had good support, but uh, we're setting a direction which is a parliamentary direction. We're not setting a, a direction which is a government direction, although we take account of that. Um, so I think it's right for us to 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 have our own our own line that we take. And uh, I've got to bear in mind, of course, that in my delegation, you've got people who are fiercely pro-European and people who were eminent uh, on the Brexit side of the argument. So, so it's a question really of finding a way through that means that we're discussing the key issues. We're doing our best for Britain, but we're recognizing that we are to some extent a divided house. Thank you. I'll come to you now, Alex Hillbrook, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think what you recognise is that we are parliamentarians from across the divide. Um, and we within NATO, you know, SNP want disarmament, nuclear disarmament. Um, but I get asked when new colleagues come on board, you know, what shall I say, etc. And I say, say whatever you want to say. Ask any question you want to ask. You know, ultimately, we're all elected. We're all intelligent people. We all do a lot of reading. We all have our own opinions and our own background. And I think that in a truly... Um, organization that you want to be able to have an open and wide conversation it is important that none of that is diluted into this is perhaps how the civil service would approach it or, or diplomat would approach it it's about your parliamentary assembly and i think there's an importance in the style of parliamentarians in and how they take part because there is a secretariat around it 
who report impartially, and that every member, you know, all of us recognise, as I say, Brexit and and, um, and remain differences. Um, you know, I literally have you know, an SNP member, the SNP policy to get rid of our nuclear deterrence. So I think it's important that people feel that they can ask whatever they want to ask, because it's an old adage, but there are no stupid questions, because it adds to debate and it adds to bring to an area. Um, and there's no flippancy attached to any of that either. This is this is important level. And I think the people involved um, recognise um, the importance of the issues and I feel that they need their freedom as parliamentarians to be able to um, link together. I think there's a whole further debate about how clerks could interact with each other, how they could interact um, with us in terms of, we were talking about Select Committee on Defence, Select Committee on Foreign Affairs, linking into the clerks that um, deal with my committee um, may have its advantages. Um, and I think that's a wider debate as we move forward to how perhaps we can um, get more value added even further out of, of what goes on and move forward. But I do think it's important to recognise that parliamentary assemblies are, as I said at the start, we're backbenchers. We're not tied to civil servants line to takes. We're not in the eye of the global media. We can have honest mm -hmm. and frank conversations and put forward any question we feel relevant. And even if that goes against our own government policy, because we're trying to explore um, what's there. But, you know, if we go against our own government policy, we're just a backbencher who said something. We're not a story of being a minister who said something. Thank you. Lord Rickards, your final reflections. Well, I think you heard here from my two colleagues a sensitivity on the side of parliamentarians not to want to uh, be served up with um, necessarily government policy thinking or strategic advice that they need and want to work it out for themselves. I think none of that um, precludes um, background briefing from the government to support the work of UK delegations and I, my experience that is always available. Um, sessions with officials before meetings so that issues can be discussed but I think when it comes to setting the strategy for UK delegations to these parliamentary assembling it is that needs to be done within parliament and with the resources that parliament has. Uh, we do indeed have uh, excellent researchers in the uh, Commons and Lords Libraries, we are well served um, with that sort of factual research. The briefing provided by the clerks and, and the researchers, I mean, uh, I think I'm not telling secrets out of school to say it's certainly as good as anything I got when I was permanent secretary in the Foreign Office, and in some ways sometimes better. So I don't think there's any lack of research support uh, as well as other kinds of support. Um, but I think we have to recognise there is a difference between what a civil servant can do from the government and what parliamentarians want in terms of their own uh, view that they've worked out through debate within the UK delegation. And we have to respect that boundary, I think. Great, thank you so much. We're running out of time. Well, we've run out of time. So I'm just going to thank everyone for attending um, the seminar. I hope you found it as interesting as I have. I've learned lots for sure. Um, thank you in particular, obviously, to our three panellists for sharing your insights and reflections on the topic. And before you all go, just to say that if you found this today's seminar interesting and you'd like to support the Hansart Society so that they can do more seminars like this for free, please do consider um, supporting them. Uh, hopefully, they'll put a link in the chat so you can see how you can support the Hansart Society just by becoming a member or subscribing to the newsletter or indeed to make a donation if you want to support them to put this type of um, seminars in the future and to develop all the wonderful research that they produce. But for now, it's thank you and goodbye from me.